Welcome to APEC. It's February 13th, and I'm your moderator, Tim Ventura. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this call, along with everyone watching us on YouTube. We have a big session for you today featuring WARPA founder and former Airbus, Airbus VP, Jean-Francois Genest, along with Boeing engineer Mike Gamble on gravity modification. We also have the infamous Jeremy Reese, aka alien scientist, who will be presenting on metamaterials and materials engineering. This week, we're gonna mix things up just a little bit, starting out with a half hour lab update from Mark Sokol and the Falcon Space Team, who are going to walk us through the tremendous progress that they're making on their many exper experimental projects. So just a couple of quick announcements. Our new website is now online at www.altpropulsion.com. Again, that's www.altpropulsion.com. And you can always view our conference events on American Anti-Gravity or on Alien Scientist as well. Please save your questions for the Q&A session after each presenter finishes. Please type your questions into chat and we will go through them after each presenter wraps up their presentation. So without any further ado, let's hand things over to Mark Sokol and the Falcon Space Team. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Um, we're here at the lab in Hawthorne, New Jersey. Um, there's gonna be an update from this lab, from Jeremiah's lab in Milwaukee, and also Todd DeCiato uh, down in North Carolina is gonna be giving us an update as well. Uh, hopefully we have enough material to fill half an hour because there's a small uh, progress on each little experiment that we're working on. Um, of course, the big experiment that we're working on is the Alzafon experiment. And there's now there's two uh, variations of it. There's the uh, dynamic nuclear orientation using uh, a laminar magnetic field and the microwaves, uh, which hit the uh, electrons at the Lermore precession to orient the core of the atom. And for that, we needed to build a, um, a microwave uh, tuned microwave cavity chamber. Uh, we sent out the copper to the uh, machine shop and it came back. It needed to be polished. So that's something that I've been working on over here. Uh, we're trying to get a mirror fine polish on it. Uh, we're going to probably be soldering it together. Um, and then there's going to be a plate at the end that is can move in and out. So it's tunable. And then we can detect whether it we're reaching resonance or not. Now, the way we're going to know if we're reaching resonance is through this device over here. This is, uh, of course, a Klystron. It is powered by uh, this uh, 5,000 volt half amp power supply that Jeremy hooked us up with. This is our uh, signal analyzer. And this over here, these are power meters that hook up to um, these cross guides, which tell us the forward and aft power. So we can know when we're getting reflections back and uh, when how much power we're actually pumping into the chamber um, and how much is coming back. Over here, we have isolators, which are basically one-way uh, tubes for oh, like one-way diodes for uh, waveguides. And then beyond that is a tuned uh, waveguide piece that's tuned precisely to 6.28 uh, gigahertz. Um, so it has almost a little uh, tuning pins inside of it. And uh, that was also picked up by Jeremy from the same place. So that is the update on the, um, the high power version of the Alzafon experiment. And we also have another version of the experiment that's based off of uh, Mark McCancer's ARV. And I showed this to uh, David and he, he said that his he actually showed it to his dad when his dad was alive. And his dad mentioned that this would also create dynamic nuclear orientation. And the, uh, co uh, the coils over here are being pulsed by the um, high voltage capacitor in the base. So we call this experiment easy alzafon because this is a lot easier to achieve than you know, the whole microwave system. And here is our first attempt at it. And for everyone who watched my uh, YouTube videos on this, there was many problems with this setup and it started to make sense why that uh, diagram had the coils inside of glass. Because when you apply a high voltage to these, and this is a sinusoidal high voltage, so it's a high voltage peak one way and it's going back the other way and we're using a spark gap to make that happen. Um, these are the high voltage capacitors, by the way. But when you pulse it with high voltage, and we're talking about like 10, 15,000 volts DC or AC actually, um, the coil, because they're not really well isolated, was sparking to itself. And uh, the, the, the very thin uh, uh, isolation material that we have over the wire was, not, was completely insufficient. So we needed to make a new uh, coil. Um, and further talks with Todd, 
uh, who is also on our team, Todd DeCiato, who will be presenting next, um, he mentioned that if you had one side of the coil longer than the other, it would uh, produce a uh, you know some sort of effect. And that's and when I looked at the uh, ARV picture again, that's exactly what I saw. You see, one side of the uh, of that coil over there is slightly longer than than it's longer on the base than it is on the top. Um, Jeremy Riss came down here after his interview with uh, Tim Poole, and he helped us build this over here, which is, I don't know if you can see it very well, but that is chock full of, uh, of electromagnetic wire, and it is in the exact same shape. Um, there's, we, we still have to fill it up with epoxy and stick it inside the vacuum chamber to suck out all the holes. Um, that's the next step that I'm still working on. The epoxy that we have for that is epoxy cast 690. It's a two part epoxy, it's supposed to be extremely thin and we'll be able to pull all the air out and uh, hopefully we'll have a um, electromagnet that will work with the high voltage. And uh, that's pretty much the update from the lab. I think, uh, Todd, do you have anything? Hey, is Todd there? I, you know, I'm not sure if Todd is with us. I believe Jeremiah is here though. Jeremiah, do you have an update? Yeah, I've, I've been crazy busy, but I'm, I'm not feeling well at the moment at all, and I'm way behind. My camera decided to uh, glitch out and um, destroy itself or, or something like that, my regular point and shoot. So uh, all the pictures that I had on there may be corrupted on the memory card, and uh, that, that was kind of unideal to have happen, you know, right before I was about to, to do a, a set of pictures. I guess I can show a few things here. Um, so I have been quite busy making a variety of different uh, different dot product discs for the Banderic experiment. And these are some of the newest iterations. I tested the amount of charge that I could store on a copper disc equivalent to these things. They're five and five inches or something in diameter thereabouts. And um, I'm able to store about uh, 15 volts on a one microfarad capacitor with just solid plates. And so I can get an additional three and a half volts on that capacitor with the addition of this, uh, this material here, which is about 5.2 millimeters thick, which basically means that the charge is being stored inside of the disc itself. It's not being stored on the surface like a regular capacitor plate because this increases the capacity of the system. Uh, it's, the charges are, are actually leaving this, the electrons are coming out of this disc here, leaving it positively charged. And because there's so much copper mass, there's so many free electrons to leave, it allows the negative disc, which is solid, to really be charged up. So that's, that's been good. We actually are getting significant increases in the complex field components from these discs, which is really, really nice. And uh, they're pretty balanced. So I may actually try to spin this up at uh, maybe some uh, five to 10,000 RPMs just to add that little bit of extra, because I, I can't really take the cross product discs beyond 15,000 RPMs without reaching instability problems or being concerned that the G6 might you know, blow out. Um, we also have, through these guys together, just some fun. I've, Always wanted to build these Boyd Bushman magnetic beamers. So uh, Boyd Bushman has a uh, patent about a magnetic beam generator that can shoot out a beam by modulating it with a electromagnetic coil, which is effectively what this is. Now I didn't uh, I didn't try to modulate these back neodymium magnets directly because they're effectively conductive, very conductive in fact, and uh, they'll short out any eddy currents that you wrap around if you try to wind a coil around these things directly. Um, I could use ceramic magnets, which won't suffer that problem. And I may very well go to that. But for now, I'm just trying to disrupt the, the field linearity that goes between this back magnet using this small coil and the rest of the magnetic assembly. And then I should be able to detect it very well with this. So I haven't had a chance to hook this, uh, this coil to the scope yet. I am capacitor discharging uh, into this coil here with a 1 kV capacitor, 1.1 microfarads. And so to pair with that, on the other side, there is a, uh, a second beam where they actually face together like this so that the, uh, the rear magnets are facing apart from each other and they should establish a connection which is easily broken by modulating that field with either this coil or the other coil. And then of course we also have uh, a momento, a lot of force to try to pull those things off the bar <laughs> because Ziggy's big old magnet experiment so these are the two inch diameter, one inch uh, thick N42 magnets that I got for the big news. Um, 
rotating okay, field those. experiment. Oh yeah, very much so. I have this thing shockingly close to my computer. I have to be careful which direction I pointed in because I was, uh, I just took a small neodymium and hung it from a string. And uh, from about four feet away, the thing is strong enough to polarize itself or when you release it, it almost instantly pulls itself straight. It doesn't really even bob back and forth. So these things have a hell of a field extending out from their poles at least four feet. And if, if you measure the weaker field, you know, with the compass, you can pick it up from nine to 10 feet away. So that's, that's pretty good. And uh, now these will have to rotate at least 4,000 RPMs. We're gonna try to hit some 7,000 if that's possible. But we'll see. Uh, building the capacitor part of that system too, those magnets are gonna be wrapped in an axial capacitor that's wound around it. So there'll be a, a solid piece of dielectric that surrounds those magnets and then entrapped within that dielectric will be another electrode um, which will be charged up and then the entire system spun. And so what we're hoping is that the electric field uh, of the rotation being you know, produced under that strong B flux will have some kind of either propulsive effect or uh, weight loss that we're looking for. It should pretty much simulate sort of like the rotating dipole moment of an atom. So that's uh, what we're gonna find out pretty soon here. There are lots of little experiments that we have uh, going on in the interim that are sort of pieces of larger experiments, wireless charging, so we can uh, isolate systems or wireless uh, power regulation into some of these circuits. I wanna power the tubes with a wireless interface um, via coil so that I can send uh, you know, at least 25,000 volts of isolation. And the reason why I want to wirelessly operate the tube filaments instead of having them run off batteries is because it'll allow me to uh, have multiple tubes in series so I can get a higher rectification voltage off those things without having to worry about changing multiple batteries or triggering multiple circuits. Uh, that pretty much covers what I have going on in the immediate uh, that's ready to show. I have a lot of stuff that's not ready to show that I can't just pick up and, and stick in front of my webcam. Uh, I wish I would have had better pictures to, to kind of show off, you know, the high voltage power supplies and all that stuff, but things happen. <laughs> doesn't always go as planned. So that's, that's the basic, uh, what I can show you for now from the Wisconsin lab update. Wonderful. Well, Jeremiah, thank you. And, and let me see. So we, we can go back to Mark, but we do have Todd here. Let me Excellent. ask Todd to unmute. I'm here. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. And let's try the screen share now. Nope. I don't need it. That's all right. Okay. Hey, um, so over the past couple of weeks, I've uh, been working on my NMR experiment and uh, I'm gonna move aside so you can see the picture behind me. Um, I have the, uh, on the little circular plate there is my NMR board that I designed, which has uh, the bandpass filter. And then next to it, there is a breadboard with a TNC 4.1 microcontroller. The, the uh, TNC um, is a 600 megahertz microcontroller that has 18 analog inputs, but I'm only using two of them at a time so I can sample at 25 kilohertz. So that gives me plenty of bandwidth to uh, record the earth field NMR signals directly into, the, into RAM and put it on an SD card or into a spreadsheet. And um, I can also look at it in real time with this, just like an oscilloscope. But with it, I can simultaneously measure the magnetic field strength as well as the, um, the signals from the NMR. And that's, that's the goal. So I could get everything self-contained and uh, if somebody wanted to replicate the experiment, they don't need an expensive oscilloscope. So I basically uh, put this together and then you see to, to um, the left over here <laughs> is the, uh, the zero gauss chamber. And so that's got my Helmholtz coils and my gradient coil and my sensor inductor and all that's powered um, with, um, through the board and this power supply over on this side and the power supply there, I've got two um, potentiometers that give me the ability to very finely control the magnetic field of the Helmholtz coils and the gradient coils. Uh, Todd, sorry, sorry for jumping in. I have uh, screen sharing enabled if you want to do that now. Uh, it looks fine. I think it's good. It's the same picture as all I wanted to show. So that's what I have. Um, 
So I spent some time programming, but uh, most of the time I was working my day job. I have a, a startup solar company here in North Carolina, and we finished our first solar project. So I was uh, it passed inspection, everything's done. And so I was real happy about that, but it kept me busy for the last two weeks. So that's pretty much it. The next goal is to uh, start putting in some samples and well, um, first, I'm going to characterize the magnetic field and record that data. And then I'm going to start putting some samples in and see what we get. And uh, that's pretty much where I'm at now. Um, so hopefully in the next week or so, I'll have some data. Wonderful. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Okay. So let me, let me see. I'm going to remove spotlight there. Okay. And let's go back to Mark. Mark, do you have a little bit more to share? Okay. Um, yes, so uh, Mike Gamble was going to talk about the um, gyroscope experiment. He asked me to uh, show him our gyroscope setup. So this is the device I built, um, and it's basically four gyroscopes. They're all spinning. Um, on this side, they're spinning uh, clockwise, and the other side, they're spinning counterclockwise relative to the motor. So we had to wire the motors backwards. They are the same uh, gyroscopes that he is using. And um, I checked them with an RPM meter. They are moving at around 20,000 RPM each. They have the degrees of motion of freedom are 90 degrees forward and to the side, and then 90 degrees vertical. So where you're basically taking off a quarter of a, or an eighth of a sphere, you would call it. Um, and uh, this is all remote controlled via a RC controller, a programmable RC controller. So I could literally, do any um, movement that with is within the constraints of these uh, servos and the set, the servo setup. You can see over here I have the servos mounted off to the side for this for the x axis, but the z axis is literally correct, uh, directly on it. Um, this is the standard setup that you'd have in the pan and tilt setup for a uh, FPV you know camera on a drone or something like that. Um, this is the third iteration of this device. We have ran it a couple of times and have, have seen some anomalous uh, results. Um, and uh, I do believe there is a connection between angular momentum and linear uh, motion. And if we can prove that, then that would also explain where uh, inertial mass comes from. Because if you think about it, the core of the atom is literally just a whole bunch of these gyroscopes with complex uh, spins. So if you're moving something around, if you're moving an object, then you are going to change their spins if there is a connection between linear momentum and angular momentum. So um, that's why I think this is a very important experiment. Another experiment that we were going to try, which is uh, similar to this, is the, um, we call it the, the mono or the uh, rotating uh, mercury. Uh, Jer uh, Jeremiah over there in the Milwaukee lab has about 20 pounds of mercury available. I have a couple of pounds over here as well. We plan on setting up a uh, negative flow hood uh, chamber near the window right behind me. And we're going to work on mercury over there. We're gonna have tubes set up and uh, basically a linear motor and we're gonna push the mercury through it. The question is what shape to make the tubes and how exactly we are gonna build that. So if anyone has any input for that, that will be helpful. Also, uh, getting back to the Alzafon experiment, we are in search of an NMR or an EPR electromagnet. If anyone knows anyone for um, any unit for sale, uh, we do have a budget and uh, we're looking for something with at least a three inch uh, uh, cube space of uh, with about one Tesla uh, and the uh, ability to do NMR, EPR, like a, a very homogenous field. So if any of the universities that you're in contact with has an NMR or EPR uh, magnet set up for sale, just uh, shoot me an email at uh, falconspaceprogram at gmail.com. Uh, we have seen one on eBay, but we are kind of concerned that because of its condition and its size. So um, if anyone knows anything, hit us up. Yeah, and uh, speaking of, of requesting information, I am looking for assistance designing a churro split ring resonator array. I have an idea about the frequency range that I want to run in. 
Um, I'm mainly concerned with what kind of driving frequency I can get away with and still still get decent coupling and, and how I want to interface with those rings. So if anybody happens to be an expert on metamaterials or know something about metamaterials and might be able to help me design a split ring resonator array, I could certainly use the help. Please feel free to email me at exoticpropulsion at gmail.com. And uh, hopefully we can go from there and I'll fill you in on some details about the experiment. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremiah. So actually, we did have a question. It looks like we have a couple of minutes. Uh, Paul Murad has been raising his hand. Uh, Paul? How you doing? When you uh, fool around with this mercury, you're going to stick any barium titanate in there? Um, the, somebody actually once recommended that, and I mixed. I actually have a little pill jar with mercury and barium titanate mixed together. I have no idea what I'm going to use it for, but I have some. Why, why would you recommend we do that? It's going to give you some nice effects. Okay. Well, I already have some. Well, what kind of effects uh, will happen and what do I do with it? You let me know. <laughs> well, we're, we're wondering, like, how do we run it? Are you saying just rotating or circulating mercury with barium titanate mixed in it is, uh, is you know, I'll tell you to... what, do, do it both ways. Run it with no barium titanate and then run it with barium titanate and see what happens. Okay. That'll be interesting. Uh, the question here is, uh, I don't know, you, you guys are a bunch of young guys, so there it is. I don't know anything about it, but uh, there it is, literally, barium titanate uh, mercury. Okay, have you heard about red mercury? That's what barium titanate and mercury looks like. Okay, but do you, you know, the thing is that certain stuff in there, like uh, uh, ending up with red mercury, that goes back to World War II and a lot of rumors, and you know, there's got to be some effects there. Okay. Yeah, I, I would assume that it's some sort of ferrous uh, metal that doesn't amalgam with copper, with uh, with mercury. Because you, you want to keep the mercury liquid, but you still want to move it through the uh, uh, the MHD. And uh, mercury is not a very, you know, ferrous material to, move, to be moving through an MHD. So throwing like little powder to iron or, or any material that wouldn't amalgam with uh, ferromagnetic fluid or anything like that. That's what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. But it needs to uh, not amalgam with the, uh, with, with, with the mercury. That's the concern. Okay. Okay, well, let me hear, let me mute. Thank you, Paul. Um, so does anyone else have any questions really quick? We've got about five minutes left. And let me see, anybody else, any questions for Mark about the lab updates? You guys have a lot of experiments going, so. I would say one other thing that if, uh, you could also reach me at altpropulsion.com, uh, altpropulsion at gmail.com, the email that uh, the invite is sent out from. So if you have any uh, links or any anybody selling an NMR or EPR electromagnet, you can just reply to the invite and uh, we, we'd get that information directly. Oh, and it looks like, let me see, um, Michael, oh. Michael Richardson might be raising his hand. Oh, David Alzafon says something as well. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Ah, David was asking about waveguide design. Um, David, let me, let me, uh, you can unmute yourself if you like. There we go. Ask to unmute. Um, so the waveguide design right now, we're just going with ah, the wave David. length okay. or width and, and length. The wavelength being, you know, the uh, the length of the actual um, gigahertz wave, and it's going to be short, sort of like a square, you know, shoe, a rectangular shoebox design. So the uh, the waveguide piece is coming in and it cuts off at a ninety degree angle into this box. That's what was suggested by uh, Tanya Slowetsky. I'm not really sure how to pronounce her last name of the Penn State University, who works on uh, similar projects down in the two point four gigahertz range. So um, that's what we're doing over here for the X-band and for the C-band version of the Elspun experiment. And David, David, you're unmuted, so go ahead, sir. Oh, I, I don't have anything to add. I know that um, Mark was uh, seeking some um, advice about construction of the waveguide so as to achieve dynamic nuclear orientation. And um, that's one part of the design that I couldn't relay because um, well, actually, somebody contacted me and said they would work with my dad, and they didn't want me to publish that. So I've had to keep it reluctantly close to my vest. But it, um, 
it seems to me that the design that he used could be improved on. It wasn't a, a huge hump, but uh, as long as there are all these people out there in the audience with that technical expertise, it seems that you should be able to, to get a good waveguide design for the experiment. Yeah, what's really important though is to make sure that you have really smooth surfaces. Um, like over here, you can see the, uh, my reflection off of this copper. This was, um, this was several hours of work to uh, polish each one of these. You need to have little, literally mirror perfect uh, uh, polish on the copper and it needs to be similar uh, dimensions on either side. And you need to have a way to know when it's tuned. If it's not tuned, it's not gonna work. You'll be uh, shooting energy right back into the source and that can also break your, uh, your amplifier, in this case, the Klystron. So um, it, it, all the ancillary equipment are, are also very important to figuring out what you're looking at. And uh, we're also going to plate this in uh, silver. Once it's complete, we'll plate it with silver. I have a special silver plating polish that we're gonna put on it because silver has a higher Q factor than copper. I have one more question, um, Mark. And that is, um, are you going to be able to tell whether or not dynamic nuclear orientation is taking place? Can you measure it? Uh, is there any feedback you can get that will tell you it's happening? Um, I'm not sure about that. I will. S that's something we're going to have to look into if there's any way to uh, to see that, uh, because uh, we're not we're doing the a pulsed version of it, and maybe there is some sort of feedback that you'd get when the pulse is off uh, that we can read. Um, the problem is also anything that you're putting inside that chamber is going to be receiving a ton of RF during the on phase. So how are you going to be able to read the off phase? Like the difference in, in power ratios is going to be uh, tremendous. So it's, um, it's both a mechanical problem, a technological problem and a physical problem of whether there is even a signal that will be coming out from the relaxation time. Okay. So we are at 11.58. Um, we're a little bit early. Uh, Mark, do you have any last thoughts before we before we transition over to Jean-Francois? Uh, no, go for it. I'm okay. Good. Well, thank you again, sir. And just kind of a notice for everybody, Mark and the Falcon Space Team will be here for the entire conference. And if you have more questions, I'm sure you guys do, um, they will probably be able to answer all of those later on in the presentation. And Jeremy Reese will be doing a presentation as well. So he'll be able to touch on some of these things, hopefully, as, as well.